Hi, I'm David Levine. I'm co-chair of Science Writers in New York. In the background is, behind the scenes is my co-chair, Joe Bonner. We've been doing this since April of 2020. And we're doing something different tonight. We're gonna to talk about, because we've been talking about COVID-19 for a lot. So tonight we're actually gonna to talk about tuberculosis. And we have some great guests and they're actually in Europe. Um, so, um, Terry Brand, uh, I'm sorry, Terry Bernard is the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Kiogen. Um, he joined in February 2015 to lead Kiogen's growing presence in molecular diagnostics, the application of sample to insight solutions for molecular testing in human healthcare. Mr. Bernard um, previously worked at BioMaru. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, where he served in the role of increasing responsibility for 15 years, most recently as Corporate Vice President in Global Commercial Operations, Investor Relations in the Greater China Region. We also have David Lanacero, is a pediatrics and tropical med medicine trained physician who contributed to advancing tuberculosis management in both public health and industry roles. He served as the World Health Organization Medical Officer for Childhood TB and Research in Indonesia, where he coordinated pediatric and research work leading the first TB prevalence survey in the region. He's also had many, many publications in top journals. So I wanna welcome you. Um, as you see, we have a presentation. So Terry is, uh, is going to do a little presentation. So welcome to the show, boys and gentlemen, and I appreciate you coming because for them, it's, it's, it's actually the steel day, right? It's July 14th, it's midnight. It's by steel day, yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, David. Thank you, Joe, for the invitation. And uh, thank you guys for uh, your attention. I mean, it might be late in Europe, uh, but there is no time to fight against TB. And we really appreciate this moment, this moment that we're going to share with you to, uh, I think it's someone related to your point before, David, to your uh, previous discussion. I understood that you had uh, a lot of discussion around COVID, but what we would like to uh, show today that uh, obviously, if COVID has proven clearly the value of testing and molecular testing as well in the healthcare value chain, um, there has been some uh, uh, also setbacks uh, from COVID. Um, obviously, the number of, of people dying from it. But apart from that, uh, many funds, many activities of laboratories, hospitals, healthcare professionals, governments have been basically diverted from some previous focus. And one of them is, uh, is tuberculosis. And what we would like to discuss with you tonight is that, unfortunately, we know now, and it's not just tuberculosis, by the way, we could say the same to a certain extent about oncology as well, but tonight tuberculosis, that COVID had an impact in the number of people that we have been able to diagnose uh, and therefore also to treat for TB. And this probably will create a future problem. Our company, Davide and myself, uh, um, is uh, uh, Kayagen, and uh, um, uh, we are not going to, uh, go line by line through all the slides today. Uh, uh, some slides are mainly as a backup. I'm just going to say a few words, very few words on Kajen. But I think the important point is that uh, David and I uh, spend time of uh, why is it still important to fight against TB. I know that many people, especially in the US or in Western Europe, have believed for many years that TB was eradicated. It's not the case. And uh, uh, um, growing issues like HIV or other infections and co-infection between TB and those infections is proving obviously that TB is still there. TB, TB is still a significant killer. But sometimes when you talk about uh, tuberculosis, people do not know about what we call latent tuberculosis. Uh, um, and as we will try to uh, uh, show you today, if we are not able to have a comprehensive action against latent tuberculosis, to be able to detect it clearly enough and early enough, and to treat it, obviously, latent tuberculosis basically is the tuberculosis of tomorrow. 
um, so um, uh, very quickly, um, Kayagen, uh, in a nutshell, uh, we are a European headquarter company. I mean, uh, our headquarter is in Germany, publicly listed in Europe and also in the US. We have significant activities in the US with uh, uh, development and manufacturing in uh, Maryland, in Massachusetts, in California as well. And basically, for the last 25 years, we have been developing solutions, molecular solutions, I would say, uh, 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 for the life science world and for the clinical world, uh, um, especially around two key applications, oncology and infectious diseases. So basically, Kyogen has been dealing for many years, for the last 20 years, from with solutions based on PCR, next generation sequencing, now digital PCR. We are a typical, I would say, diagnostic company. We have uh, uh, both instrumentation and what we call reagents. Uh, and uh, we uh, basically continue to try to expand our activities all over the world, not only in developed countries, but also in many emerging countries, as you can see here. Uh, um, I'm not going to go to more details here. What is important is to start here. Obviously, uh, as I was saying before, uh, uh, COVID had a tremendous impact, uh, number of deaths, obviously, and uh, uh, economical also uh, uh, um, um, impact on, on many countries. But it had also impact on other diseases. Uh, uh, and uh, um, um, when Kyagen, since the beginning of 2020, has been developing very quickly and ramping up manufacturing for a wide array of solutions against COVID from extraction of nucleic acid PCR testing, monoplex testing, short place testing, syndromic testing, uh, uh, genomic surveillance, uh, uh, um, what we call uh, also uh, um, our T cell uh, um, uh, um, uh, solution for SARS CoV 2 to uh, uh, monitor the evolution of T cells uh, uh, after vaccination. Uh, there is no doubt that many of our activities have been uh, also impacted. And one of them is uh, we happen to be uh, one of the leaders in latent tuberculosis detection. Uh, um, and uh, as you can see, here is a very simplified slide. But I believe, and I can go very, very uh, uh, quickly here, that you clearly understand that, obviously, because of the effort dedicated to COVID testing in 20 and also early 21, a lot of labs have completely shut down their activities on other kind of testing. TB is one of them. Second, obviously, you can easily understand that when in some countries, uh, Western Europe or uh, uh, the US, I mean, having a lockdown was potentially acceptable for many people in many, especially developing countries, because of poverty, it's impossible to stay home and lockdown. People need to be on the street and continue to work to basically trying to earn a living. This is the case of India. This is a case of uh, 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 Brazil, obviously, just to say the least. This is a case of part of China, many Asian countries. And obviously, uh, uh, while at the same time, we didn't have any funding for, for example, the diagnosis of TB, obviously, the condition for spreading the disease were uh, um, uh, very much gathered. At the same time, obviously, lack of uh, uh, capacity, capabilities in diagnostic translated also in lack of treatment and funding allocated to treatment. Overall, I mean, long story short, uh, um, um, uh, many diseases, including TB, have suffered tremendously. And this is what is recognized as a uh, widely official statistic, you know that the WHO has made the eradication of TB a kind of priority, yet we know that in 2020, there has been probably, and this is probably under-evaluated, a 50% reduction in TB case, in tuberculosis cases, the, the uh, uh, detection. And most of the numbers are saying <coughs> that starting in 2020, TB mortality is going to increase by at least 1.85 million people. And it's at least five years of fight against TB that have probably been uh, lost uh, um, because of, of COVID, because of, again, of reallocation of funding and priorities. Here also, I can go very quickly. You see that every situation was uh, uh, um, uh, basically uh, uh, um, coming together for creating extremely potentially dangerous situation for 
uh, uh, spreading infectious disease, of which obviously is TB. Uh, uh, in many countries, again, once again, Brazil, India, many others, emerging countries, crowding population, the population density, poor ventilation, the quarantine increasing when people were staying home, obviously, we are talking about home with large households and large families. All this obviously leading probably to a, a ramping rate of infection. We will come back to those number uh, um, in the in the in the at the end of the of our discussion. This is to set the stage. But the main, the, 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 the real discussion that we have, we would like to have with you, and I will leave the floor to Davide, is to explain to you obviously the mechanism between TB and latent TB and why latent TB is so important in the fight against TB. Davide? Thank you, uh, Thierry, for that introduction. And even just from the title here, TB and Latin TB, I think we, we could spend some, some words. Uh, for the purpose of this discussion in, in the next uh, 20 minutes, uh, we will stick to these two terms intending TB as the active uh, uh, disease manifestation, while Latin TB, as the words implies, uh, is the infection without disease manifestation. Uh, it's a very academic uh, dichotomy, um, which, which is evolving, and I, I will show you uh, why the interpretation of Latin versus active is slightly changing. But what is key here is to understand that it's not only about Latin TB. Latin TB is strongly and closely correlated uh, to TB prevention, uh, and, and that's what we'll be debating. So Thierry, can you move to the next one, please? So just to put some perspective, in particular from a number point of view, if you look at the um, graph to the left, um, you can see that there are 10 million estimated TB cases worldwide. And there is a gap, and, and Thierry was hinting that the gap being even bigger now uh, in post-COVID of, of about 3 million of undetected cases. And that gap is what is driving the perpetuation of transmission uh, and infection uh, in, in the community and, and globally. Um, one key aspect of TB that makes this gap even more dramatic is that compared to disease like, for example, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, for which now we are unfortunately very familiar, the time for which an individual remain infectious can be as long as 24 months, two years. So you can imagine the number of contacts that a single individual can accumulate in that period, those, those uh, uh, 10 million estimated cases, even when they are diagnosed, there are delays uh, averaging six to 12 months in detection. And of course, as you are aware, a portion of those cases uh, are multi-drug resistant or resistant to rifampicin, that is the single most important drug in a TB uh, regimen. Why is diagnosis so complex? Well. If you look at the TB care cascade, it's highly complex. Not only that, there are several opportunities for losing the patient, either because the patient does not present to the care uh, facility, there is a misdiagnosis because of diagnostic delay, initial loss to follow up following a diagnosis, as well as what we call default to, to treatment. So there are plenty of opportunity that diagnosis can be, be missed, or even if diagnosis is confirmed, patient not put on treatment, and therefore, again, increasing that exposure and, and, and increasing transmission intensity. What we are referring here is to active TB, but if you look at the graph to the right, the pyramid there, when we talk about active TB, the top triangle there, we are really just talking about the tip of the iceberg, because really the base of the pyramid is what we have defined Latin TB infection or TB infection without active TB um, uh, manifestation. Let's call them silent carrier. There is an estimated 1.7 billion of the world population uh, affected by, by Latin TB infection. And the I call the historical estimate, uh, although there are wide ranges, is that between 5 to 10% of those infected will develop TB in their lifetime. Next one, please. So I just want to spend, uh, and, and I'm probably oversimplifying it here, the concept, but just to clarify that there is no such a clear cut dichotomy between uh, the active TB and Latin TB. What you see here to the, uh, um, the colorful diagram to the left 
is that what we actually have is a continuum of infection. We have an unstable latent TB infection, and I will explain you why we call it unstable, which then progresses towards a subclinical phase. And you can see here both the unstable and partially the subclinical are not detected by culture, by microbiology, uh, or imaging, or even PCR, and evolving then very slowly into clinical TB, which becomes detectable by, by active TB diagnostic. Why I'm showing this is because it is this unstable LTBI, which is the untapped opportunity for TB prevention. And you can see here, we call it unstable because that latency can be upset by either predisposing factor or precipitating factor, which you can see here are mostly factors that impact on the immunological status of the patient. And you can see at any of these stages where this predisposing factor can be present or precipitating factor can emerge, we have an opportunity depicted here by the, the blue and, and, and red balls of intervening with TB prevention, as we will see later. Next one, please. Now, let me just give you a quick historical uh, background and insight on what TB strategy has been uh, for the last 25 years. Um, the, the first ever uh, WHO endorsed strategy for TB was developed in the early 90s. It was born out of East Africa and actually carries one name, Karel Stiblo, uh, uh, a refugee from Czechoslovakia into Netherlands, which with the KNCV uh, Royal Dutch Tuberculosis Foundation came up with what was known as the DOT strategy. Now, each of the three strategies depicted here can claim some fame in terms of uh, number of deaths and cases prevented. The DOT strategy, the first one between 94 and 2005, actually has been defined by the World Bank as the most historically most cost-effective ever public health intervention other than vaccination. However, even here, we have what I call the original scene of, of TB control. And you can see that DOT strategy was relying simply on case detection through passive case finding. So, I started working in TB around those years in 95, 96. And what we were preaching was waiting for the patient with the three or more weeks of cough presented to the healthcare system. That evolved into the stop TB strategy, which took a more, which took a more active role in going out and screening patients and identifying active TB. But what you can see, it took almost uh, actually over 20 years for a single word to finally appear in the TB strategy, and that is prevention. So TB prevention in terms of uh, providing TB preventive treatment, not to cases who have active disease, but have latency, only came as a programmatic intervention. Of course, uh, um, TB, TB preventive treatment has been available very early since, uh, since uh, the advent of isoniazid, and you can go back to the uh, historical papers by Comstock et al of the studies done in Alaska and Greenland uh, of mass intervention to be prevention, but it was never a programmatic pillar of any global strategy. Only in 2016, with what is called the NTB strategy, setting a goal uh, for 2035, uh, we have finally a patient-centered TB approach, which is holistic uh, and includes prevention in addition to active case management. Next slide, please. So that led to the first ever WHO consolidated guidelines on, on, on TB prevention. And you can see here, without going too much into the, the details, so this is actually the flowchart for TB prevention uh, decision making in the WHO guidelines. So a caveat here is that these guidelines are devised for high burden country. So the, the actual uh, um, uh, approach and paradigm in the United States or, or, or a industrialized setting like in, the, in, in Europe, uh, it's slightly different, it's much more testing driven. But what you can see here is that there are three main groups where that TB prevention plays a key role in the HIV positive, the house of contact and other risk group, which is really uh, spanning across from uh, alcohol abuse, diabetes, all the way to immunosuppressed individuals for causes uh, other than HIV. And you can see here that TST, tuberculin skin test, and many of us uh, uh, have, have probably had as part of our 
school testing back in the days, uh, you're probably all familiar with the skin test, uh, or the interferon gamma release assay, for which uh, uh, Kygen has, has a quantiferon product, which we'll be uh, exploring in a second, are advised, particularly in the other high-risk group and household contact. For high burden setting, the WHO controversially, because there, there are quite a lot of controversy around this decision, still advises for HIV positive individual to be put on preventive treatment regardless of testing. There are two reasons behind this, and we will explore some of these today and, and, and really showing how Kajen has been trying to address this. One is in relation to the fallacy of, of tuberculin skin testing, particularly in age of individuals uh, who already experienced low CD4 count, uh, as well as the logistic uh, of, of the skin test, uh, and the IGRA not having penetrated much uh, the, the high burden setting, but again, we show a potential solution uh, which we've been working very hard uh, in the last five years at Kaijen. Next one. So just to, first of all, um, explain the difference between these two test, the, the, the 120 years old uh, uh, tuberculin skin test, uh, um, which again, you're all familiar, is, is, a, is a, a few uh, microliter injection uh, subdermally um, into, into the, the forearm. And you can see here, without again going into details, the complexity of the skin test for a number of reasons. It is a two-step testing. You need to be tested and returned to be seen by the physician 72 hours later. It's a subjective test because the reading is subjective. It's done with, with, uh, optically with a ruler by the physician in reading uh, the induration on the skin. And it's got specificity issue because the antigen utilized in the PPD, which is injected, are not specific uh, for the mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, but uh, span throughout the mycobacterium complex, uh, including atypical mycobacteria, and most importantly, the BCG vaccine uh, uh, strain. With the Quantiferon Plus, which is the brand name of the IGRA developed by uh, Kygen, you can see here a decrease in complexity, but most importantly, it ends the two-step testing. It is a one-off visit. Uh, it's a blood-based test, so objective test, control with a negative and positive control, with uh, overnight results, no need for the patient to return, um, it can be communicated uh, uh, to the patient in case of positivity. The Quantiferon Plus is ELISA-based, so the reading is based on ELISA, following stimulation of, of uh, the PMBC by, um, uh, by antigen in, uh, in the collection tube. Next one. So, as Thierry rightly highlighted, why do we want to talk about TB prevention, tuberculosis, and LTBI in the context of COVID-19? Simple, simply because the two overlap from a point of view of where transmission takes place. Transmission takes place in, in the household and in the congregate settings for COVID-19 and TB. So there is a clear overlap, but also because of the disruption that COVID-19 as, as uh, created to TB services. But let me just give you some pragmatic example around this. Now, there's been a lot of debate about the biological plausibility that COVID-19 um, can increase susceptibility uh, to TB infection. It is fascinating. I don't want to dwell onto that. Um, that is, is very beautiful science uh, to discuss. However, the single most important cause of potential increase in the years to come of TB is simply the disruption of diagnostic services. I've seen that firsthand when I was in Indonesia as a, as a WHO medical officer. I was uh, um, unlucky enough, I would say, um, to be uh, there at the time of the 2004 tsunami uh, in, in Aceh. I was in the Aceh province. What we saw amongst that tragedy was another tragedy unfold up to two years later because of the disruption of the diagnostic service, and the time we calculated 70% were acutely disrupted, destroyed the laboratory services in the province of Aceh, we saw an increase of 80% of cases in the turn of two years of TB, simply because the cases went undiagnosed. 
Make a parallel with that situation with what has occurred, for example, in India, which is the number one high burden country in the world for tuberculosis. So imagine the impact that that three periods of acute COVID uh, and continuing now has had on TB uh, diagnosis. And that is key. Next one, please, Thierry. Uh, it's sometimes a bit slow to move, David, so excuse me. Yeah. No worries. Now, I, I, I promised to Thierry I wouldn't go into any mathematical modeling, but I cannot spare you this one. Um, I feel this is the most important uh, model that uh, uh, has been developed uh, um, by Professor Dai, um, that at the time was leading the surveillance unit at WHO, demonstrating why TB prevention has finally made it in the top five uh, uh, elements, uh, programmatic elements into the TB uh, and TB strategy. If you look at the case prevention, the model provides a baseline mitigation or risk factor, but let's focus on treatment of active TB, which for 15 years uh, um, has been uh, the mainstay of TB control. Now you don't see the dark blue because it's overlapping with, uh, with infection prevention, but you can see here that the target of reaching 10 cases, sorry, one case per million uh, by 2050 would and will never be reached simply with uh, treating active TB. With the addition of treatment for latent TB, you see a progress, but it's only with a synergetic approach of combining active and latent TB that potentially we can uh, reach elimination uh, and much earlier uh, diminish the, the burden of, of death. Of course, one line that we have removed from here, just not to open a, a new discussion, is, is a potential new vaccine for TB, which could make this acceleration even, even steeper. But the key message from this model, and this model has been replicated also now with, with several mm -hmm. empirical examples from real data where TB prevention has been scaled up, only by making TB prevention a programmatic intervention along with active case finding and management, uh, we can even start thinking of TB elimination and eventually e eradication, which, which I think uh, it might be an hazardous statement. Uh, but uh, we, need, we, need to, we, need, we need to accelerate a bit. Uh, sure, uh, please. Yeah. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. If you, if you yeah. can go, go next slide, please, Terry. OK. And next slide. No, so at Kaijin, what I just wanted to, and I hinted at the beginning, the, the, the three products uh, that I feel are meeting those uh, those needs uh, that we listed so far is obviously Quantiferon TB Call Plus. I described that uh, to, to really address the need for, for high um, uh, throughput, uh, particularly in screening program, and we've seen this need in, in Europe uh, uh, amidst the, the, the migrant crisis as well in, as in the US is the automation solution. And that's something that in collaboration with Diasorin we'll be able to offer. But most importantly, which I think is one of the topic for tonight is the idea of TB testing in low resource region and trying to move to a solution which still has the reliability of the IGRA, but without utilizing ELISA technology and moving on to digital lateral flow. And that is the Kaya Rich solution, which you can see here um, is based on a single to, um, uh, blood uh, collection tube and uh, um, e-stick, uh, which is really a digital lateral flow, which in the turn of eight to 10 minutes provide the result. This is a portable hub, battery operated. It can be operated under a, a, a tree in the open air. Next one. I mentioned the automation. I don't think I need to spend too much time on that. And if you can just uh, uh, go through this one, Terry, perfect. So this is the concluding slide. And again, it just compares the two workflow be, be, between the two uh, product, uh, the Quantiferon Plus, which is our original state-of-the-art uh, technology, which requires uh, um, uh, incubation, uh, 16 to 24 hours, uh, centrifugation, and ELISA either on manual or automated solution. Now, obviously, this has been a state-of-the-art solution that has served the purpose in, in uh, industrialized setting, low middle incident country. But really, the need was to support that WHO strategy to develop a solution that could be scaled up in high burden country, low resource, low technology. And that's where this workload come into place with the Kaya Reach, where we have 
um, uh, stepped away from ELISA. Um, uh, we still have an incubation step, but then we move directly into a lateral flow technology, which does not require any laboratory support. This is not only important from a technological standpoint, but it really opens the door to equity in access uh, uh, testing to, to latent TB infection. Thank you, Thierry, over to you. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, because David uh, uh, rightly so would like to uh, accelerate and move to the question and answer. Thanks, David. Um, uh, basically, um, in a few lines, I mean, what, what we have seen with, uh, with COVID-19, as I was saying at the beginning, is obviously the crucial importance of testing in the healthcare value chain. Obviously, molecular testing is proving also to be a kind of gold standard for many infectious diseases, by the way, also including, uh, including TB. What we also too many times uh, or too often hear is opposing uh, testing and treating or treating and testing and people saying, okay, if we vaccinate, we don't have to test or vice versa, where we believe that the real strategy for the future and the case that we are defending, obviously, together with WHO, but also other organizations such as Top TB, FINE, UNITED, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and so many others, is a test and treat strategy. First of all, because we believe that there is no better way than trying to stratify the patient that really need, obviously, uh, a treatment such as obviously a therapeutic or tomorrow a vaccine. So there is a cost efficiency in those test and treat uh, uh, strategy. This was in a nutshell. Uh, you see that it's a long-term, obviously, fight. We have uh, uh, fought in many countries that TB was eradicated. It's not the case, even in the Western world. Obviously, in the emerging countries, it is still extremely prevalent. We are trying to innovate by bringing new solutions that are more accessible, more cost-effective, not needing big equipment laboratory. Tomorrow, what could be the horizon? And I will be concluding with, that, with this. A company like Iagen or a diagnostic company should spend some money and here R&D fund to try to find a way, basically, to better, I would say, uh, stratify the patient that will move for sure from latent TB to active tuberculosis. And this is probably the new frontier that Kyogen would like to explore. There are different uh, avenues for that, either genetics or proteins, we'll see. But that would be the next steps and the next frontier to try to achieve. Thanks a lot. And I hope that you found that of interest. I saw, David, that in the Q&A, there are two questions already uh, um, uh, on that topic. OK, um, thank you. Um, can you stop sharing the screen? So. Let me stop sharing. Uh, OK, here we go. Thank you. Um, so, I'll get, so, so whoever, so the audience, please put the questions in the Q&A box. And I'll get to them in a moment. Um, so I do want to ask you know, a quick question. Um, where is TB most prevalent right now? With, you know, it's, it's in Africa, is it in... Yeah, you have, uh, I think, uh, uh, David uh, alluded to that. Uh, obviously, the country number one is probably India, uh, obviously, but uh, the case of India, it's, it has spread beyond India, and, and David, feel free to chime in, obviously, but uh, uh, the problem also in those countries that is that you see the emerging of extremely resistant strains of TB, uh, resistance to many kinds of antibiotics, which is creating other burdens, obviously, but in the most rural uh, areas of China, it is still a tremendous, obviously, issues. Overall, I would say that every uh, uh, emerging country has a potential issue uh, 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 ticking, bong, uh, ticking bong on their healthcare system. But David, what would you say to that? Yeah, no, and, and if we need to pinpoint geographically, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, China, and Southeast Asia, particularly okay. Indonesia. Those account uh, for probably around 70 to 80% of the global burden. Yeah. So we're, when we're talking about, you know, millions of people, a million people dying every year, but this is going on for many, many years. I used to work at the Lung Association. And this has not captured the imagination of the, you know, Western world as, as COVID-19, which is a pandemic. And like you said, there, I mean, in 1988, there was a TB outbreak in New York City, which led to 
all New York State children having to be tested for TB. So, but it's very rare in, in the, you know, the countries in the United States, in, in England where we live and other places. And do you think that's part of the problem? Is that because COVID-19 affected you know, the United States, Italy, you know, you know, very badly, you know, South American countries, and you know, probably you know, media reporting and stuff. So I, I would say, David, you can chime in whenever you want as well. Sure. But David, David, to your question, first of all, I would say uh, there are progresses. Uh, 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 many more countries, including Western countries. So first of all, as we said at the beginning, many Western countries for too long have considered that the problem was basically not theirs, basically because TB was not existing anymore inside their frontiers. I think they are trying to, they, they are changing their, uh, their vision here. Second, you see many more countries, David, uh, trying to make testing for latent TB obviously compulsory for some population. Healthcare personnel, for example, with regular checkup. You see there are regular campaigns, what we call back to school campaigns, for example, in the US, where we are also screening students. Uh, 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 there are efforts to go towards the pediatric also world. Uh, many more countries, emerging countries, Brazil, for example, just took some guidelines to basically uh, uh, reimburse the test. So, so it is moving. The problem is that uh, 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 because it's a kind of, a, I would say, silent killer, I think too many people have been getting used to that. And therefore, since it's not a massive pandemic, so you don't have the, the same kind of funding altogether coming. But David, you have also your point as well here. No, I mean, I, I fully agree with that. I mean, th there are a lot of socioeconomic uh, uh, um, factor at play here. And, and I think historically, the fact that uh, the burden has been in, in low resource country has had the tendency to push um, developmental solution towards the lower end of, of technology. And I think that has been key in exacerbating this problem. Secondly, um, uh, to a certain extent, I want to highlight, uh, it has been in industrialized country in Europe and in the US, uh, a disease of marginalized population or high risk population, right? While COVID has this dramaticity of, of being uh, uh, of spreading through the general population very rapidly, TB not only is low, but is more pocket based. Uh, but said that there are clear um, clear evidence of, of the disease uh, being more generalized in, in, in certain countries uh, uh, where we've seen a, a resurgence. So I think that there is, there is a multifactorial uh, uh, contribution there on, on why it has been neglected. And, and David, I think as, as I shared with you, uh, I think last week, uh, um, uh, um, uh, are you still there? Yes. Hello? Yeah, uh, um, for me, what, uh, uh, what is also a, a concern for the future is that uh, um, if you take China, for example, the Chinese authorities are perfectly aware, and I'm not judging the, 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 the country, huh? it's, it's a fact, and it's uh, are perfectly aware of the tremendous reservoir of latent TB in China. The point is that they are already faced with a significant number of active TB. And somewhere they are afraid of being too vocal around latent TB because they are afraid, obviously, of creating a kind of panic inside the country. Let's not forget that for every Chinese of, let's say, 40, 50 years old today, every Chinese of that age have seen a member of its family or a family dying or being impacted by, COVID, by, 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 uh, by TB. And so you have some of some some resilient some some uh, reluctance sometimes of some countries of open of opening the box of latent TB because because they don't know how many people really are exposed in their countries and we need to 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 deal with that obviously there is a question David I think in the Q and A is get interested I think uh, uh, a person called Connie Trimbles yes uh, the the Bill and Medi Daggett Foundation is interested. Uh, in, in working on TB, David, do you, you want to say a word about this? Sure, I mean, uh, Gates, so, sorry, David, you were saying anything? Well, why don't you just read the question? So, that yeah, can... it's a, so, so we have a question from Connie Trimble said, is Gates interested? We have two others, but I'm starting from uh, with this one, so. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the Gates Foundation has been one of the main uh, uh, drivers uh, 
from the from the early days from its foundation, TB and malaria were the two uh, key diseases uh, that, that the foundation took took on board, uh, um, and and uh, particularly on the diagnostic development, but on the act TB, not on the latent, as well on the therapeutic development in supporting uh, several new regimens. So the the Gates Foundation has been behind that and continues to be uh, with the funding of the MRI, the Medical Research Institute. Uh, now the Gates Foundation is trying to drive more um, uh, the, the, the development of, of new therapeutic solutions. So definitely it is engaged. And there are two more questions from Connie, yeah. which I, I think I'm happy to take. The first is, do point of care tests identify TB that has mutated? Do we know sequences that mediate resistance? So, I mean, just to be clear, the point of care solution we discussed uh, as a collagen solution is a solution for latent TB infection. Unfortunately, the detection of latent TB infection is an immune based one because there is no viable mycobacteria to be detected. It is latent and therefore there is no way to identify any marker resistance. However, to answer your question, in point-on-care solution for active TB, yes, there are plenty of PCR-based solution targeting uh, uh, sequencing and, and, and snippets for, for resistance uh, for the um, most important uh, uh, drugs uh, as part of the uh, sensitive TB and resistant TB regimen. Um, yeah, to complete to perhaps that, that point, Connie, is that... Um... For many years, many people have been trying to develop a simple test, immunochromatographic based, like bandlet testing on TB. We said that we are coming with one for latent TB with the Kaya Rich because we have basically solved the issues of sensitivity, but many of those tests will never be sensitive enough or not sensitive as sensitive as PCR. So that's a limitation at the moment. We have um, a question on do diagnostic tests identify latent TB and what activates latent to become full-blown TB? Yeah. Yes, so the diagnostic tests that detect latent TB do not detect TB, but they indirectly uh, detect the immune response uh, uh, and it's a cell-mediated immune response to TB. There are two forms, the interferon gamma release assay, which I described earlier, and the more traditional skin test. But both are based on the detection of an immune response after stimulation with an, uh, an antigen. Um, uh, I, I, I lost the question now. Was there a follow-up as well on that? Um, no. no, I don't see that. It's a therapeutic. And, and as we said, Roberta, I mean, um, it is our ambition also to try to work on solution that could stratify patients with a high probability to go from latent TB to active TB. This is a kind of holy grail. We have done some research based on, uh, on uh, 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 genetic, genomic markers. Uh, we have worked also on some protein markers. It's still very early stage, but we believe that one day we might find a way to, uh, to, to make this possible. Okay, um, someone asked, um, can you provide a web link to a global statistical report on TB? And I think you, you just go to the World Health Organization. And, and yes, uh, the the WHO website or the stoptb.org. Um, uh, stoptb.org has a link to the annual report from which the figure on slide 10 I presented are coming from. Stoptb.org. So I, I want to talk a little bit about HIV and TB. I, I went to a lecture in the 1980s where Lee Reichman, um, who's a pretty well-known researcher, he drew a circle, TB, and drew a circle, HIV. He said, when these two meet, there's gonna be a lot of trouble. And they have met. So why, why are people with HIV so prone to tuberculosis? And what exactly is the controversy about having them all tested or, or treated? Yeah, so um, first of all, it's always good to hear that someone has, has, has witnessed uh, Lee Reichman lectures because they are uh, uh, really, he, he's been one of the uh, fathers of, uh, of uh, TB, TB control. And I've been lucky enough to, to travel around the, the world visiting TB clinic with him. Now, the issue of TB HIV, I mean, what we know is that uh, 
particularly below a certain CD4 count. So the inactivation of CD4 activity is a major trigger for, uh, for TB activation. And that I think uh, um, it partly answered the previous question as well. When does latent TB activate? And in and, and mouse model uh, where, where CD4 are artificially depleted uh, clearly demonstrate that. Now, the controversy about testing or treating everyone, well, around treatment, I think that controversy is over for industrialized country because it's not the HIV itself, which is a risk factor, but it's really a CD4 count. So with the advent of antiretroviral therapy um, and maintaining a CD4 above uh, 200 counts, uh, it's really rare to see an increase in risk in TB activation. And therefore, exposing an HIV patient uh, to potential liver toxicity of isoniazid or, or uh, uh, anyway, exposing to uh, periodic uh, treatment with, with rifapentin uh, is not advisable. The question is, and I mentioned it in the guidelines that I showed, in high burden countries uh, uh, where the WHO, because of the lack of resources, still recommends uh, um, the, the universal treatment uh, without testing. However, there is a movement toward changing that, particularly with solutions like the one we, I show you, Kaya Reach uh, as a digital lateral flow, making it easier, not only ethically, but also from an antimicrobial stewardship point of view, which now is of essence in any public health program, becomes really important. So testing and treating is slowly creeping in as well there um, in, in that conundrum of, of uh, HIV TB prevention without testing. It is changing as well. So the first treatments for, for TB were basically amino inhibitors. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not pronouncing it, ion, ion aside, but what, what, are the, uh, what, are the, what are the treatments today for TB? So, so the, the treatment for drug-sensitive TB is based uh, on, on four drugs, isoniazid, rifampicin, esambutol, and pirazinamide, of which rifampicin is really the carrier of, of that treatment. Uh, without rifampicin, we lose the efficacy, and that's where we move into second-line treatment when we lose rifampicin and potentially isoniazid, then we go in the second generation of higher toxicity, fluoroquinolone, injectable, becomes a very complex treatment, which can vary between eight months to 24 months. Um, so, yeah, I would like to go into some questions, you know, and do a little parallel with, with COVID. Um, there's a vaccine. But 100% of people don't, you know, want it. Maybe 50%, 60%. And in, are there societal factors, resistance factors that make? I mean, I know that multi-resistant TB is also partially the fact that people are not completing their treatment. Yeah. So, um, are you referring to the the TB vaccine, the BCG vaccine, or or TB prevention in in uh, in its pharmacological uh, intervention? Well, I know that in, you know, um, in New York, there was a big debate over whether to make, you know, make people actually, you know, you know, have observed therapy, making sure they got the yeah. medication or else you could have multi-resistant. Yeah, you know? uh, absolutely, David. So, and, and there are several aspects to that. First of all, in the treatment of active TB uh, and, and the direct observed treatment, the DOT has been key because of the reluctance to adhere to such a, a long, I mean, we're talking about uh, six months of daily treatment. Uh, we're talking a bulk of, uh, of, of pills. Uh, pill. And, and, and the, and the, the re, the re, could you go could on you mute? Go on mute? Is there is a return. return? No, no. Thank you. So, so yeah, the direct observed treatment is really targeting uh, um, the adherence to treatment, avoiding uh, interruption and emergence of resistance. Um, that is, is, is key. When it comes to TB prevented treatment, it's even worse because you're talking about individual who have tested positive on an immune test, but have no symptom whatsoever. So originally in the US actually for a long time, the, the treatment was nine months of uh, isoniazid. And to force someone to take nine months of pills without having the slightest symptoms uh, 
it's, it's actually very complicated. We're most likely away from that, in which we have now rifampetin, uh, rifapentin, sorry, based treatment, uh, which can be a month of daily treatment or three months of weekly treatment. So adherence is slightly improving, but that's key. We have talked a lot about testing as, as a conduit to TB prevention, and we have shown what we're trying to do with Kaya Reach. But David, until the day we have a treatment, a uh, prophylactic treatment that can be taken as a one-off or potentially, um, you know, as, as a couple of, uh, of treatments, uh, um, I don't think we are going to get the uptake in TB prevention, which we, we are all hoping for. So if you x-rayed the population of the United States, you would probably find people who have latent TB and have absolutely zero symptoms. I know this is the case in my family, one of my relatives, she was you know, 75, she went for a routine x-ray and the person said, my God, I see TB lesions. She never was sick a day in her life. Um, so I, I can see that you know, it is a problem. So there's another um, question from Connie Trimble. What is the TB reservoir in Latin infection? Yeah, so I think what is meant by that question is, is the actual population with latent TB infection represent the TB reservoir from a biological and physiological standpoint, if that is what you meant, uh, um, it's, it's residing in the mediastinal lymph nodes, and that's where your latent mycobacteria resides. But the reservoir in epidemiological terms is intended as that part of the population affected by TB infection without showing uh, active symptoms where there is no replication of the mycobacteria. To your previous point, David, uh, um, as we discussed also you and I a week ago, um, one of the key also for the prevention, both for Western and also for emerging countries, is the screening of immigrants. Uh, uh, um, and this is something which is happening compulsorily in many countries, not in every country, but for example, screening of immigrants for latent TB is compulsory in the US, compulsory in the UK, compulsory for many uh, 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 Western countries. And you see that also happening. It's compulsory now in China as well. So, so this is also a way to try to detect as early as possible. And that also goes into the sense of fairness and why am I, why are immigrants being singled out? And so, no, sure, sure. Yes, but, I mean, but, in every in every um, illness, you find that there are there's you know, it's not purely medical. There's always no, no, for sure, for sure. You know, for sure. So, I have, so for your test that you're you are doing, can very poor countries afford to get to take these tests? So, so this is why we, we launched that new solution that we are going to launch in the second half of this year. The, the product is ready. Uh, um, the objective was, uh, first of all, before affordability, which is a key point, David, but it's basically is of use. Uh, David has started to talk about it. Completely portable. It's very rugged. You can run eight tests at the same time, have a very quick result. It's basically immune to high temperatures. It's battery operated, so you don't have a. You can do that in a remote uh, uh, hospitals, for example, in in Africa. Also. Uh, the price uh, um, will be also made available uh, for those countries. Let's be let's be very clear. A normal, and I'm normally not talking about price, but given the complexity of the technology, a normal uh, um, uh, latent TB test is. Uh, let's say between 20 and 30 dollars, uh, uh, according to the countries. This price, uh, if you want to go to large scale screening, is absolutely not affordable for many emerging countries. So it is our objective to bring it down. Uh, we have a clear mark of $10 maximum. It's a bit similar to the story of HIV, something like 20 years ago, uh, uh, basically, uh, 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 David. Uh, the HIV viral load, which is a key test, I mean, was a, uh, at a, when it was launched in Western countries, was a $100 a test. And some countries like South Africa decided at the point to cap it at $10 and period, you see? They started to cap at, at 20 and then $10. So um, it is our goal to make it perfectly uh, affordable. This is why also we cooperate with uh, with the WHO. Uh, I, I mean, here it's uh, it's it's rather 
a question of medical education to convince local MOH of the usefulness of testing for latency B, and therefore, therefore, we can also make pricing even more affordable than the ten dollar test that I was mentioned. So the World Health Organization set a goal of eradicating TB in, I think, 2030. Um, and do you think that's possible based on what happened with COVID? And I, uh, I, I think the answer is, is um, you know, targets are always being set by the stop TB um, to stimulate progress. Uh, uh, and, and it's unlikely they are going to be achieved in that format, meaning elimination or eradication. But I think definitely um, th there has been progress and we've seen an impact on mortality. So in, in, in 20 to 15 years, we have a half mortality. Mortality has decreased by 50%. So intervention are having an impact. The question is acceleration. And really there are two things that can accelerate. One is TB prevention and WHO has been slow, is picking up, I think, there are going to be forces beyond WHO that can accelerate that and a vaccine, which is beyond really, um, you know, the global health drive is it's really from a development side. With those two solutions, then uh, it's not I, but I think we think uh, then that that acceleration uh, that is needed can take place. Okay, so gentlemen, it's uh, the middle of the night for you. So I'm going to thank you both for um, sharing with us. Um, your time. This is going to be on YouTube. We're recording this for YouTube and we will send you the links so you can promote it and send it to people and we will promote it as well. Um, I just want to announce um, we're taking, a, Joe and I are taking a break for two weeks. Um, he and his wife are going away for a week at the end of July. I'm going away next week for a few days. So we'll be back in August with some new shows. So again, I want to thank my wonderful guests um Terry and David and thank you for staying up to very late and um again everyone a lot. stay safe and uh, take care and thank you yeah, again. thanks a lot David and Joe for your invitation thank and I you. saw that your audience is also very fluent in foreign languages from what I saw so so thanks a lot for your attention bye bye thanks have a good thank night you. bye thanks David